Okay, so welcome to the seminar. Um, I'll just start the introduction by saying that in the, the early 1980s, my, the first semester at McGill University, I took a course in Yiddish literature and met Ruth Weiss. She was my, one of my first professors at McGill. And incredibly, I think she really took the text of uh, Yiddish literature, which I used to read as a kid, and really brought it alive and just introduced to the class layers and layers of analysis. And through our analysis, which we did together as a class, we tried to interpret the social, cultural, political, economic implications, ramifications of the text. And she was really inspiring and helping me to develop tools for analysis, which I hopefully went on to my studies and really brought, I think, the art of study alive for me. So it's really a privilege to be able to introduce, introduce Ruth Weiss to you. She's the Marty Peretz Professor of Yiddish Literature and a professor of, professor of Comparative lit Literature at Harvard University. She taught at McGill, Stanford, New York uh, University, Hebrew University, and Tel Aviv Universities. She's, as you know, well published. Uh, she's written books um, and translated books on, some of them are, for example, entitled, If I'm Not For Myself, The, the Liberal Betrayal of the Jews, The Shamil as a Modern Hero, A Little Love in Big Manhattan, and I.L. Peretz in the Making of Modern Jewish Culture. So without further ado, it's really a privilege to introduce Ruth Weiss. Today she's going to speak on how anti-Semitism succeeds. Professor Weiss. Well, uh, this is a great, uh, great, great pleasure for me. Uh, when Charles told me about the idea for this center, I have to say I was my usual skeptic. I don't know whether you know the reputation of people who come from Lithuania. Um, my family is Lithuanian in heritage and uh, we are reputed to be skeptics. Uh, but I stand here as someone who has been enormously impressed and moved by what the center has accomplished so far. And um, I'm really in so grateful to you for having founded it. Uh, it it's a, an inspiration to those of us at other universities and uh, also grateful to some of you in the audience who have been instrumental, I think, in helping this um, center and will continue, hopefully, to do so. So some of you have already heard in this lecture series here many approaches to this issue by some of the best thinkers and actors in the international arena. Uh, let me explain to you my approach. I think that anti-Semitism is primarily a political phenomenon, which requires a political solution. And um, when people identified a new disease called AIDS, which is A-I-D-S, the Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, you notice that they didn't erect museums to victims of the disease, or uh, established courses to trace its history. What they tried to do was to uh, isolate the variables that caused the disease and that contributed to its spread. They identified modes of prevention and went about trying to find a cure. Now AS, our subject today, anti-Semitism, has an equally fatal impact on the societies that it infects and yet it hasn't elicited any such response from political scientists into whose domain the problem falls. Political science and government departments spend almost no time on this most stubborn uh, of its problems, and Yale is here the very happy exception rather than the rule. But even here, I think, the university has not said something like, our goal is to eradicate anti-Semitism by the year 2150. Well, why is that? Why don't we approach AS like the crisis that it is? And why doesn't one assume that it too can be contained with the proper antidotes? Um, there are many uh, answers to this rhetorical question. But I have to say, I will begin at least by approaching anti-Semitism as a political problem. I'm perfectly aware of many, many complicating factors that contribute to it. 
religious factors, historical, social, economic, but I believe that it's the political dimension that subsumes all the others. Anti-Semitism entails the political interaction between Jews and anti-Jews. And so my first task here, which is maybe a little different from that of my predecessors, is to understand the political behavior of the Jews. Well, the loss of sovereignty in the land of Israel was the defining political event in the life of the Jewish people. Before then, Judea, with its capital Jerusalem, had been a province of the Roman Empire, paying heavy tribute to Rome, yet conducting its affairs with perceived, if not with complete, autonomy. Despite great discord among Judea's religious and political factions, King Herod, had restored the splendor of the temple that served as the center of legislative and religious activity. But many Jews were angered and provoked to revolt by the capriciousness of Roman rule. So in the year 70 of the Common Era, following a three-year siege, Titus crushed the Jewish uprising and burned the temple, leveling the city so that, in the words of Josephus, no one visiting the spot would believe it had once been inhabited. 65 years later, Rome put down a second Jewish rebellion with a brutality that deterred any further insurrection. Some Jews always continued to live in the land of Israel, but the vast majority over the next 18 centuries tried to follow the Jewish way of life outside its borders. Now mourning that great destruction became so intense that it almost competed with praise of God as the central motif of Jewish worship. Rebuild Jerusalem, the holy city, quickly in our time, reads the liturgy that's incorporated into the grace after meals. When a Jew dies, as you know, many of you family members are consoled with the words, may God comfort you among other mourners of Zion and Jerusalem. For three weeks of every year, culminating in the fast of Tisha B'Av, the ninth day of the Hebrew month of Av, Jews commemorate the fall of Jerusalem. The annual Passover Seder concludes with the pledge next year in Jerusalem. It is simply not true that Jews were a people without a land. Jews always knew they had a land. They prayed facing the land, and they knew that they would be returned to the land either during or after their natural lifetime. But in the meantime, they were able to live outside it. Now this is the interesting feature. What was it that made it possible for the Jews to live abroad? Um, a number of things. Foremost among them, I think, was an attitude to national defeat that had been determined even earlier by an earlier destruction and exile. After the reign of David and Solomon, which was the high point of Jewish national sovereignty, the kingdom was eventually divided into two parts. Northern Israel disappeared with the fall of Samaria in 721 of the, before the Common Era. Southern Judah fell to the Babylonians in 586 before the Common Era. The invaders then, too, destroyed the temple that had served as the center of Jewish religious worship and drove the Jewish leadership into exile. Now, at that point, it's clear that the Jews might have disappeared in history like so many other conquered people. That they did not assimilate is largely a function of how they understood their relation to God. Through the covenant at Sinai, Jews had entered into a covenantal relation with an almighty whose moral law curbed certain forms of behavior and required others. In return for obeying this law, Jews had been promised that they would someday multiply and prosper in the land of Israel. King of kings was no mere metaphor. It was a precise description of how the almighty dominated the political triangle the Jews thought they formed with foreign nations. In other words, Jews would be protected from aggressors if they satisfied the terms of their covenant with the omnipotent. And thanks to the understanding of this position, the prophets 
felt justified in construing the defeat of the Jews as the consequence of God's dissatisfaction with his people. The prophets taught that the political fate of the Jews depended on their ability to convince not their rivals of their military prowess, but God of their uprightness. They linked a nation's potency to its moral strength, putting the Jews on perpetual trial for their political actions before a supreme judge. By thus maintaining an independent reckoning, Jews did not have to accept conquest by their enemies as any judgment on their staying power. You understand, other nations accepted defeat as the arbiter of their political fate. And Jews obviously recognized the difference between conquering and being conquered. But by situating their politics within a transcendent scheme of judgment, they did not have to give in, they did not have to accede to the verdict of the battlefield. The explanation of military defeat as a consequence not of the enemy's prowess, but of the Jews' failure to please the Lord, insulated Jews from some of the vagaries of war. A temporary rout left open the possibility for an eventual reversal, just as temporary displacement from the land of Israel allowed for eventual return to it. The more power Jews ascribed to God, the more politically independent they became of the power that other nations wielded over them. At the same time, living under the aegis of a God who kept an extended rather than a short-term reckoning instilled a very high level of accountability in Jews, since the behavior of this entire people, their everyday habits, would determine the severity of the collective punishment or the possibility of their collective reward. Oh my god. Believe it or not, I'm the culprit here. <laughs> it's too embarrassing. It will stop ringing. <laughs> my sins. No, that's it. I think five is the last one. God. I am so embarrassed. <laughs> Please forgive me. By the time the Romans crushed the last Jewish revolt, Jewish society had undergone changes that eased its transition to life in exile. Firstly, Ezra the scribe who edited the Torah had instituted the custom of reading it as the centerpiece of national religion. If you remember in Nehemiah, it says, on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the teaching before the congregation, men and women, and all who could listen with understanding. He read from it, facing the square before the water gate, from the first light until midday, to the men and women, and those who could understand. The ears of all the people were given to the scroll of the teaching. Now, what did this mean? This meant that the scriptures were read aloud to the assembly, and... And this is crucial here. It's not just that the Torah was read aloud to everybody, all men, all women, and everyone who could understand. The word understand there is, by the way, repeated several times in that same little passage. Um, but it was also interpreted in Aramaic in the vernacular. The teachers were to see to it that every man, woman, and sentient child not only hear but understand the national books and so that same custom of reading and interpreting the Bible also spread to houses of prayer far removed from the temple, ensuring that the foundational texts became the permanent Jewish core curriculum. So that's one thing that kept, made it possible. So we now have here this triangular vision of Jews really being maintained politically by what they can prove to God. We have their uh, culture of literacy and the responsibility of everybody for that text, for that code of law. Then, too, 
Because not all the Jews had returned from Babylon when they were permitted to do so, Jewish life already flourished outside the land of Israel during the period of Israel's sovereignty. And there emerged a class of rabbinic scholars and interpreters whose court of law, or Sanhedrin, made its decisions binding on communities abroad. Once the rabbis began to codify the oral law that interpreted the biblical injunctions, they laid the groundwork for an independent judiciary with far-reaching powers in all areas of life. This judiciary was or originally um, situated in Jerusalem, but it could also be situated elsewhere, teaching as it did that the world is sustained by three things, the Torah, worship, and deeds of loving kindness, all of which could be observed outside the land of Israel. Synagogues, as yet more concentrated on study than on prayer, sprung up within and outside the land, uh, anticipating the practice of Jewish religion through later centuries. Jews learned to feel, as one historian has put it, at home while abroad, by refashioning institutions and practices once associated with the great temple. A third feature, maybe a fourth feature, of Jewish self-rule was the strong decentralized leadership. When the first century sage, Yohanan ben Zakkai, left Jerusalem, he got permission from the Romans to found an academy at Yavne, and he became the nation's guide in matters of religion, which included such functions as determining the Jewish calendar for observance that would now be occurring in different time zones. By setting up this new center of legal and religious decision making, he effectively transferred the role of the temple to wherever the leadership of Judaism had its seat. Now, interestingly, this is the point at which some interpreters of Judaism believed that its spiritual essence transcended its political trappings and Isidore Epstein says it as follows, transcended as the soul may survive the collapse of the body. This was a very, very influential interpretation of Jewish history until very recently. In other words, when the Jews left the land, um, it was as if the spiritual essence of the Jews was maintained while uh, the soul was maintained and it survived the collapse of the body politic. But in fact, it's quite opposite. The academy in Yavne maintained the Jewish body politic, no less than it maintained its national soul or spirit. Ben Zakkai negotiated favorable conditions with the ruling authority to set up a durable form of institutional autonomy. And as the Nasi, or president of the Sanhedrin, he became the equivalent of the head of a Jewish government in exile. In many respects, Jews were no less political in negotiating life in Yavne than they had been when paying taxes to Rome from Jerusalem. Jewish centers in Babylon thrived for the next 800 years, and the Babylonian Talmud which was codified at the same time as the, as the Palestinian Talmud, gradually became the more authoritative of the two compendia. The absence of a ruling ministry or national government was not acknowledged as a problem by those who took over the functions of a decentralized leadership. In all, I would say, the Jewish diaspora was one of the world's great political experiments. A nation undertook to live without three staples of nationhood, without land, without central political authority, and without means of self-defense. Jewish communities thrived wherever they were permitted to do so. The 19th century economic historian, Werner Sombart, noticed that the European Jews had a keen ability to adjust to various cultures and circumstances. And from this, he deduced that they were nomads, or as he called them, Saharans, perennial wanderers 
who mastered trade and commerce in the process of migration. It was an ingenious theory, but it drew the wrong conclusions from accurate observations. The Jews were exceptionally adaptable, but they were nothing like nomads in their habits, in their social organization, or in their cultural inclinations. Nomadic peoples move cyclically or periodically following the food supply of an agricultural economy or else fulfilling the functions of tradesmen. Their social, political, and cultural institutions are geared to the, fun to the habits of frequently relocating themselves. By contrast, Jews manifested just the opposite penchant for sinking roots, very deep roots, and establishing enduring institutions wherever they were allowed to do so. They negotiated their relationship with those in power, usually through the payment of taxes, trying to work out the most favorable conditions for permanent residence. This diaspora experiment required creative accommodation, adaptation to local political rule and socioeconomic opportunities. It proved, I would say, astonishingly successful, since Jews, as I said, flourished wherever they were invited or permitted to do so. Look up the synonyms for adaptation, and you will discover Jewish communities at work. Elastic, flexible, pliable, supple. Jews tried to master the skills that would make them indispensable. Under some conditions, this meant money lending, tax farming, minting, banking. Elsewhere, it meant craftsmanship. They became shoemakers, tailors, carpenters, glaziers, all the trades that are turned into metaphors in the Yom Kippur prayer, ki hine kachomer biyad hayotzer, that likens material in the hands of the craftsman to the soul of the Jew before God. And if you look at that prayer, you'll see that all the craftsmen really were the craftsmen that, that, that Jew, the crafts the Jews engaged in. And Sailor Baron, the great historian, describes how Jews tried to compensate for their political weakness with economic strength, even turning dispersion itself into an asset by developing international trade routes. We could go on. Um, and uh, I would say that the description of this, what I call this great political experiment, is a joy just to see how extraordinarily well it worked. But built into the Jewish political condition was the inability to protect whatever it is the Jews attained or achieved. At some point or other, a change of authority, a threat to the kingdom from a foreign attacker, the uprising of a restive underclass, or some other destabilizing political event would force or persuade the ruler who had until then given the Jews their protection, um, would persuade him to withdraw that protection or else to initiate or to join in the assault against them. And at this point, we shift our attention from the politics of the Jews to the politics of the anti-Jews, to see why Jews were assaulted so brutally and so often. Extrapolating from many situations, the historian Gerson Cohn noted that the safety of the Jews will always depend on a society in which their interests are guaranteed and maintained, but that any breakdown of the social discipline within such a society exposes Jews to resentment and danger. And he pays special attention to populist eruptions against the Jews that rulers and clergy are powerless to check. He draws examples from the Jewish community of Elephantine in Upper Egypt, which was destroyed in 411 before the Common Era. The Jews of Alexandria in 37 of the Common Era, the Crusades of 1096, the Spanish riots of 1391, the Ukrainian pogroms of 1648-49, to show how in each case Jews were sacrificed by their former protectors to the violence of the mob. <laughs> 
Jews had visible power and goods to tempt their assailants, but no means of defending that power and those goods once their political shield was withdrawn. So here is the rule of thumb. It was always profitable to take over Jewish power and property, and there was never any political cost to be paid for doing so. Jews became a no-fail target. And it's very interesting how they interpreted this. Jews have always interpreted their history as, we are indestructible. Am Yisroel Chai. We pick ourselves up and we go on. That's the way one sees it. True? True. But other nations saw it from exactly the opposite point of view. They saw that the Jews were continually destructible wherever they were. Now, Cohn's analysis stops in the year 1648, but in fact, the situation entered a new phase two centuries later, at the very point that one was entitled to believe that political progress was underway. After all, enlightenment and emancipation introduced the idea and the practice of democracy that ideally guarantees equal rights and opportunities to every citizen and allows governments to be run by the governed. This is a wonderful moment in human evolution, but it had very unexpected consequences. Once upon a time, Jews had only to convince the king of the good they could do to the kingdom in order to win his protection. Now, even kings had to satisfy their constituencies. Leaders had now to persuade societies of their right to rule Governments had to explain their actions to the people. And the story of the Exodus that we have just read, uh, uh, those who read the Passover um, Haggadah during the Seder, the story of the Exodus is very instructive at this point, because what does it teach us after all? It teaches us one thing, how hard it is to cope with newfound freedom. The Torah, um, given to and accepted by the Jews at Sinai, is a very, strict code of behavior. And free people have to follow that strict code in order to become civilized. So Jews had this constitutional culture from the beginning with the goal of universal literacy, with emphasis on individual accountability. But the nations of Europe undergoing democratization, industrialization, urbanization, secularization, tremendous increases in personal freedom were composed of individuals far less accustomed than the Jews were to the self-discipline that such changes require. Now, as someone here was saying before, anti-Semitism itself, anti-Semitism, our topic, was introduced in the 1870s as a political instrument to address this very destabilized situation. Wilhelm Marr's popular pamphlet the victory of Jewry over Germandom, institutionalized anti-Semitism as a political ideology and a political movement. Marr had started out as a radical, and he remained a maverick. He had terrific political instincts. I think he's the kind of person, if you'll forgive me, that American candidates for office snap up to be their paid consultants. Um, he was among the first to recognize the uncommon power of anti-Jewish agitation, of what we would call negative campaigning. He noticed how successfully Jews were beginning to enter the mainstream of German politics, and how their political handicaps, such as decentralization and lack of military power, had been turned to contemporary advantage. He writes, this is very interesting, the Jews did not come to us as conquerors with the sword. They did not have to. Emancipation had allowed them to use their cunning to conquer, conquer the new country from within. Since by virtue, I'm still quoting here, since by virtue of our tribal organization we can never attain the energy of initiative present in the Semitic race, and since an armistice in the history of civilization is impossible, there opens before us the prospect that someday the Jews will use the law and the state 
to attain a feudal domination over us, we Germans will become their slaves. So Marr warned that thanks to emancipation, Jews had already become the leading superpower. He is terrified. He says, in Germany, it's not Jewry that has merged into Germandom. Germandom has merged into Jewry merged to the point that the spokesman for German patriotism, for acceptance of the new Reich, for our parliamentary and even our church battles are Jews. Now notice that this attack against the Jews is defensive in nature, defensive in Mars instance as a system that has gone haywire. So Marr crafted a politics of explanation for all the dislocation and anxiety of modernity. And this was simultaneously a politics of blame. The church has lost its authority. It's the fault of the Jews who are destroying our religion. Parents are losing control over their children. It's the fault of the Jews who have taken over the culture and are corrupting our morals. Are you unemployed? It's because the Jews have taken your jobs. Are you poor? It's because Rothschild has your money. Are you more troubled than you were before? It's because the Jews are screwing around with our heads. From the right, and no less from the left, politicians represent the Jews as the corrupting agents of modernity. It was, I think, an act of political genius on the part of anti-liberal politicians to cast the negative and frightening aspects of modernity as the fault of the Jews who are just visible enough to be convincing in this demonized role. And once the Zionist movement formed, partially actually, of course, in, re in reaction to anti-Semitism, it magnified Marr's accusations into the threat of a Jewish world conspiracy. The Protocols of the Elders of Zion replicates all of Marr's arguments on an inflated global plane. In his book on the Protocols, Norman Cohn writes, to portray democracy, liberalism, and secularism as the work of Jews was a way of making these, thing these things suspect in the eyes of a growing but ill-educated electorate. Now this seems to me exactly right. Right? To portray democracy, liberalism, and secularism as the work of Jews was a way of making those things, namely democracy, liberalism, and secularism, suspect in the eyes of an ill-educated electorate. It's important to see which is the vehicle and which is the goal. See, Jews are always fascinated by themselves, and what they see is that anti-Semitism is directed against the Jews. But in fact, in this analysis, and I think it's an absolutely correct analysis, the Jews are the vehicle through which an attack is waged against all the aspects of modernity that these particular politicians and leaders fear. Anti-Semitism worked differently in every country of Europe but almost everywhere it enjoyed great success and Hitler could not have come to power without it. So once we think of Hitler, we can see the benefits of anti-Semitism to those who harness its potential. And I would suggest to you, if you think of how he worked politically, think of the art of prestidigitation, of magic. I don't know anything about magic, but this is how I see the magician working. The magician says, watch my hand. Watch this hand. See this hand? Look at this hand. And he gets you to watch this hand. Now that hand in anti-Semitism is the hand of the pointing finger. Look at the Jews. It's the fault of the Jews. Keep your eye on the Jews. That's where the threat is coming on. But meanwhile, what the magician is doing, what the real hand that you is doing is the hand in the shadows, the hand that you're not watching. And what is that hand doing? Hitler is saying, I have to take control of the courts in order to protect you from the Jews. I have to take over the system of education because otherwise it is being taken over by the Jews. I have to censor the media because they would otherwise claim it for their own. So 
Anti-Semitism does not merely portray democracy, liberalism, etc., as the work of the Jews. It seizes power or maintains power or consolidates power by claiming to protect the electorate from the Jewish menace. Now, naturally, Jews perceived this threat of anti-Semitism, and they dealt with it as creatively as they could. Millions fled to America, and we could talk about this. Why to America? Well, in America, constitutional culture was more substantial and fundamental than almost anywhere else on earth. But others, like Theodore Herzl, understood that at a time of emerging nation states, Jews must also reclaim their land. Zionists concluded, very reasonably it seems to me, that the Jewish diaspora was the root of the problem. Normalize the Jewish homeland, and you would eliminate the cause of anti-Semitism. Jews would then have their own place, they would interfere with no one, and they would be out of harm's way. This was a very logical inference. And it did allow, eventually, for Jewish self-defense, which Jews had not had before. But what Zionism did not do, and I would say that it could not do, it could not have seen, I don't think, it could not take into account the instrumentality, the usefulness of anti-Semitism that had much less to do with the actuality of the Jews than with what they represented and could be made to represent. If anti-Semitism was useful to anti-liberal elements in Europe, consider how much handier it was to Arab potentates in the Middle East especially once the Holocaust had shown how easy it was to get rid of the Jews. The Jews of Israel remained a tiny polity in the midst of other nations, and they retained the political habits of diaspora communities, the habit of wanting to be productive, helpful middlemen, supplying whatever others needed, living among the goyim on the best possible terms, just read uh, Shimon Peres' account, his, his, uh, his, his account of the new Middle East, of how wonderful it will be, and you will see that what you have there is a new version of a diaspora uh, imagination, the Jews living there and being useful to everyone around, like a kind of Switzerland. Um, so I think the Zionists thought that they would win favor um, in the region by insisting that they did not come with the sword. And they did not. In fact, the yeshuv was notoriously slow in organizing even primitive self-defense. But as Wilhelm Marr had said at the outset, the Jews did not come to us as conquerors with the sword. They did not have to. Modernity, emancipation allowed them to use their cunning to conquer the new region from within. So just like Marr, Arab leaders were not concerned about Jewish conquest. They were concerned about the advent of pluralism, democracy, liberalism, modernity. They were afraid of precisely the help that Zionists wanted to offer them. So um, I won't go on for much longer, but just to say that um, because of this instrumentality, this extraordinarily, this usefulness as a political tool Anti-Semitism was the only ideology of Europe that made an effortless transition from Christian and post-Christian Europe to the Muslim Middle East. And um, the Arab anti-Semitism, many people say, um, don't compare Arab anti-Zionism with uh, European anti-Semitism. It isn't the main thing, it isn't the same thing. Well, it's true, of course, that the two situations are not at all alike. But the effect of those differences is to make the instrumentality of anti-Semitism ever much more potent in the Arab world than it was in Europe. Um, and, and just look at it from, uh, look at any number of proofs of that. For example, anti-Semitism in Europe emerged on a country-by-country country basis. And even Hitler never called a pan-anti-Semitic Congress 
to get all of the anti-Semites together. But in the Arab world, um, anti-Semitism is the glue of pan-Arabism. It is the unifying element of otherwise unfriendly and hostile countries. Secondly, anti-Semitic boycotts of Jewish stores and businesses in the 1930s were sporadic features of nationalist politics. But the Arab League organized its boycott of Jewish, by the way, Jewish, not Israeli, products and manufactured goods systematically and internationally and forced countries to abandon commerce with Israel. Anti-Zionism anti enjoys over anti-Semitism the technological advantages of a Mac over an Underwood typewriter. Hitler, if you remember, had to function as his own impresario. He had to do these giant rallies, the trouble he had to go to to manufacture these great anti-Semitic moments. But um, Arab rulers use weapons of mass communication. Um, and I'm sure that uh, from this uh, series you have been exposed to many of them. And um, so on and so forth. Um, the casting of the Palestinian refugees as permanent refugees is, of course, the greatest weapon that anti-Zionism has over anti-Semitism. And this is why the Arab rulers have kept a whole part of the Arab world hostage to their war against the Jews. And what's more, they have conscripted the United Nations as the main pulpit of anti-Semitism on an international basis. So you can see why anti-Semitism has grown ever more pervasive. So why does it succeed? Well, it attacks a tiny polity with an enormous image, ascribing to Jews or the Jewish state the blame for everything that it fears. Everyone here knows the power of negative politics. I don't have to tell you. When Americans think of negative politics, they think of who does it better, Lamont or Lieberman, right? Um, Bush or Kerry, opponents facing off against one another. But consider, Jews do not behave like combatants in the war against them because they have no incentive to attack the party from which they seek acceptance. The example I would use to you is, think of Coke and Pepsi. If Pepsi spent 60 years running ads about Coke being overpriced poison, and Coke had never taken out a single ad against Pepsi, I would like you to consider how long this uh, wonderful product would stay on the market. So, there never has been and there is not an Arab-Israel conflict. And I think that every time we use that term, we obscure the unilateral Arab war on Israel that can only be halted by the side that initiated it. Anti-Semitism works because Jews have no incentive to fight back in kind. You have a society of blame that is attacking a society of self-blame. And um, I began by comparing AIDS to AS. Two diseases, one of the body, the other of the body politic. But whereas AIDS attacks its carriers first and foremost, the carriers of anti-Semitism are not its first or obvious victims. You see, the Jewish targets of the disease cannot stop it because they are not its main carriers. And the carriers do not want to stop it because they are not its main victims or they don't perceive themselves to be its main victims. And here is where an institute such as this could play its main role because it is only uh, a center such as this, it is only through education that one can demonstrate that societies that resort to anti-Semitism must eventually, and usually very soon, destroy themselves. It is simply a political rule of thumb. The politics of scapegoating precludes corrections of the problems that those societies really confront. 
you see that the Palestinians were not so long ago considered the ablest sector of the Arab world, and they are now the most politically corrupt and dysfunctional. In failing to attend to their own internal development, they became more miserable and more depraved. Just think of how different Palestinian politics would have been had Mahmoud Abbas written his doctoral thesis about Arab health care or education or regional trade instead of, as some of you may know, he did. He wrote it on the secret relations between Nazism and the leadership of the Zionist movement, arguing that Zionists encouraged Nazism in order to gain sympathies for Jewish immigration to Palestine and so forth. I mean, this is extraordinary, right? Um, but there is no one to point out the correlation between political cause and effect. There are no Hollywood stars sporting red ribbons against anti-Semitism. There are no constituencies calling for research funding into this. There are no doctors in this area looking for a cure. And the academy, which should be in the forefront of such an effort, is most often a contributing factor to its spread. So um, this is uh, the last point here, and the, perhaps the most important one is, um, Anti-Semitism succeeds in part because of the failure of democracies to appreciate that anti-Semitism is the kindling for a worldwide conflagration. From Wilhelm Marr's day to the present, Jews have been the instrument, the projected symbol of a war against the liberalizing features that all forms of authoritarianism oppose. Um, I don't know how many of you know but if you don't, you should know Jean-Francois Revelle's fantastic book, Why Democracies Perish. And what he posits in that book is that democracy's strength, such as its self-criticism, its high moral standards, contain the seeds of its destruction when faced with an enemy uninhibited by such scruples. He writes, democracy probably could have endured had it been the only type of political organization in the world, but it was not basically structured to defend itself against outside enemies seeking its annihilation. He writes, democracy is by its very nature turned inward. Its vocation is the patient and realistic improvement of life in a community. Democracy tends to ignore, even deny threats to its existence because it loathes doing what is needed to counter them. It awakens only when the danger becomes deadly, imminent, evident. By then, either there is too little time to save itself, or the price of survival has become crushingly high. Democracies are beset by guilt-producing accusations and intimidation that no other political system has had to tolerate. Everywhere, substitute Jews for democracy, and you have a remarkable analysis of the democratic features of the Jewish polity, but you also have a guide to the common danger that all democracies, that all democratic policies, polities, and most especially, I would say, the Jewish democratic polity faces when confronted by enemies who lack their scruples. So James Wolsey, I believe, was the last speaker in the series. And after 9-11, he said, we are all Jews now. We should reflect upon the historical reality that when anti-Semitism raises its head, the rest of us, unless we are willing to live with a foot on our necks, will be the next targets. Many people take this for a metaphor. This is not a metaphor. This is a political inevitability. We know how anti-Semitism succeeds. And it can only be stopped by a political will that is equal to its energies. And it seems to me that this seminar is a means of identifying the political will that would be required to make sure that anti-Semitism does not succeed. Thank you. <laughs> I went a little bit over at that time. So thank you very Sorry. much, excellent. Uh, hello.
Well, I mean, I, this is what I'm trying to explain. As a matter of fact, um, uh, Thomas Sowell, um, sociologist um, and other anthropologists, have pointed out that um, there are very great similarities to the middleman position of the Jew and other middlemen minorities, what he calls middleman minorities. And he points out that all those middleman minorities are vulnerable, no matter where they are. It's true. I mean... Um, you take a look at economic history and political history and you see that those minorities, Chinese, Koreans, whoever, who play those middleman roles, um, uh, you know, do uh, attract a certain enmity for the reasons that I have shown. They are very successful. And he goes even farther because of the kind of success that they are. They attract envy and so forth. Um, Seoul makes the case because he is trying to prove that anti-Semitism is not, that the Jews are not generic. That this is not, he's trying to prove that this is a, you, you can abstract this into a higher level of, 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 uh, of uh, uh, you know, of, of, of applicability. But he's not right, because even though the same technique that I'm describing here works, um, all those constituent elements are added to, in this case, by the religious history of the Jews, history of Christianity in relation to Judaism, the history of Islam in relation to Judaism, and the fact that the Jews, the longer the Jews have persisted, the more this um, myth of them, the more this political opportunity has grown. So anti-Semitism is what drives this at this point, and my point is that anti-Semitism grew out of this uh, Jewish political condition, but it is a kind of a freestanding, extraordinarily powerful ideology that now functions in the world almost, I would say, independently of the Jews. Right? It, 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 has, it has outgrown the Jews. And what people don't understand is that, you see, they're so, people are almost relieved that anti-Semitism, it only attacks the Jews. Why should anyone else on campus worry about uh, the attacks of Arab students against the Jews? Well, Jews will take care of it, or they won't take care of it, but you know, it's not my concern. If, if one understood anti-Semitism's function, one would not be so debonair about it, because the Jews are ultimately too small to contain the political aggression and violence that anti-Semitism ultimately foments. They are always going to be too small to contain it. It is always going to burst over its banks. To pick up I think on a similar point, um, I think you made really, what I was worth, really important cont contribution points. And you stated that, that historically Jews have been sacrificed to the violence of the mob. And you also spoke about how Wilhelm Barr viewed anti-Semitism as, as the Jews not entering into society with the sword, but taking over the culture and taking over um, the society and corrupting it. So these are two very important points. And that anti-Semitism was also a vehicle against modernity. And it seems to me that this is precisely what's happening in the, I'd say, the, the, the Muslim Islamic world. That you spoke about pan-Arabism, but I think there's even a shift from pan-Arab uh, nationalism to sort of radical Islamicism, mm -hmm. where this is really happening in a very powerful way. So my question is, do you think that Israel, the small polity of Israel in the midst of this, uh, maybe being on the front line of this social movement, do you think that Europe uh, is tempted to sacrifice Israel to the mob? Do you think that anti-Semitism 
what, how, how would you evaluate this contemporary threat about this? Oh, well, it's, uh, I mean, you put it, uh, you know, everybody nods in agreement as soon as you say it that way. Um, there is something of that. Um, of course, there is something of that in this country, too. As you know, there are voices that say, um, you know, what is this coming to the defense of Israel? Um, it's as if, uh, you know, President Bush today or uh, President Roosevelt and Churchill in their day were coming to the defense of the Jews. Um, so they say, well, you're not going to enter a war on the side of the Jews. But, it, but the point is here exactly right, that you see the democracies have to come in on the side of the Jews. It's not that they wanted to. You know that, that Churchill might have loved the Jews very much, but he would not have gone to war for the Jews, and he never did. He didn't, he didn't lift a finger to bomb Auschwitz, uh, uh, right, uh, as he could have. It, nobody was fighting. And did President Bush go to war for Israel? Of course not. But because of the nature of anti-Semitism, democracies have to come in on the side of the Jews. But why do I say have to come in? Because they have let it go for that long. Because they have let it go for that long. Because they didn't come in sooner. And to my mind, the most extraordinary thing about President Bush, and he has not articulated this sufficiently, but this is exactly what Wolsey articulated for him, is that President Bush did come in earlier. He did come in earlier. In other words, it, this country knew that it would have to go to war. This war that is being fought, I, I hate to, to be, you know, is not an elective war. The timing of it was elective. But it is not an elective war. This is a war that this country is going to have to fight. It's just that the longer one wanted to let Israel bear the burden of it, the more violent that part of the world was going to become. And the more Israel was pushed to make concessions, and by the way, the more Israel volunteered to make concessions, the crazier, the crazier the aggressive forces against it become. It seems to me that these are political rules of thumb. Um, right? Um, so, so I would say yes, I, in, and, and Europe is playing an extraordinarily dangerous game in this. Uh, it does not see what it has at stake, and I think there are politicians in Europe that do see what's at stake, and they are fighting that, but they are uh, not uh, the, the most vocal voices that we hear at the moment. <laughs> this is an interesting question, one which I uh, w would not like to deal with frivolously or on, you know, in, in a soundbite. Um, here's the thing. Um, the generative force of what I'm calling anti-Semitism, as I decided, the, this politics of blame, this ideology and politics of blame, the generative force of it is today all in the Muslim Arab world. Um, however, what you see in our society, and particularly among some of the elites, um, is the reaction to it. So this is, it's, not, it's like a kind of secondhand smoke. It's the, the reaction to it is to go along with it, to accommodate to it, to say, um, to, to find, to find in its favor. Um, you know, if they're so angry, there must be a reason. Uh, because they're so many and so powerful, you know, let's pressure Israel to give in. After all, it's so much easier to pressure Israel to give in than to pressure the Arab world to give in, because the Arab world is not about to give in. Um, so I think it's that kind of reactive um, accommodate, accommodation to anti-Semitism is what you're seeing. It, it becomes hard to distinguish after a while, I will admit. And um, sometimes there is no line. I mean, sometimes people do cross the line and become very actively involved in this. But for the most part, I would say that what you see among the elites, it's not just in the academies. I would say the New York Times is a marvelous example of this too, right? Uh, in World War II, uh, the New York Times uh, had a policy of not drawing attention to the war against the Jews. In that 
in that point, they did it by obscuring the horrors against the Jews. The New York Times to this day has a policy of not drawing attention to the war against the Jews. This time it does it by holding Israel responsible for the aggression against it. See, but it's the same technique in either way. So I would not say that they are the fomenters of anti-Semitism, but very dangerously accommodate to it because they feel that they don't have to take responsibility for it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Recently, there was a brilliant film starring Ed Norton, The Illusionist. Uh -huh. um, and as I was watching this, as a political scientist watching this, I was struck by how Jewish a film uh -huh. on, of, a, of a country on the verge of modernity, of his name being Abramovich, of him clearly pointing, of the troops clearly after him. And one day, when he's coming out of the hall, he passes the act of Shula, where you Clearly, they are clearly making the connection that he is the voice of the Jew on the, on the eve of the journey. I was wondering why, in your opinion, if at all, there was so little discussion about this very important film that contains so many of the brilliant elements that you are attending. This is so incredible because uh, I have not seen the film, regretted not having seen it, and my husband and I just took it out. <laughs> Last night, <laughs> you would believe it, yes. Uh, and uh, well, <laughs> this is too silly. But uh, in, in any case, we, w for various reasons, we did not get to see it, so we postponed it. I wish I had spent the evening see it. I will see it tomorrow and could better answer your question. But it seems, sounds to me as if you're absolutely right. And, and that I had that sense reading about it very much. Thank you. Yes. Politically, yes. I mean, uh, again, that's too simple an answer by far. Um, Jews should definitely not change their um, habits of self-scrutiny. They should definitely not change their habits of self-accountability. But here's the point. When you go into the synagogue, um, at least in our synagogue, what used to be written over the um, um, the ark was know before whom you stand. That's the extraordinary thing. What does that mean? Of course, what it means to us is oh, know before whom you stand. Why? Because if you are standing before the perfect judge, then I have to tell it all. I can hold nothing back because the perfect judge knows it all anyway. There, I have to be entirely self-accountable and take it all on. But that is also a political rule. Know before whom you stand. If you stand before the world and before your uh, accusers and you say, yes, guilty, guilty, guilty is charged and you are always on the defensive before people who have judged you even before you, I mean, the trial is fixed. You are a fool. You are an immoralist, it seems to me, because you are really just feeding their frenzy. So I would say that that marvelous sentence, which meant so much to us in one realm, should now be interpreted in the political realm as well. And you never, never take the defensive in a situation where people have prejudged you and where uh, this, is, this is elementary. Uh, so I think the Jews have really confused these two realms very, very badly and uh, have to learn to separate them. So in one realm, no, to keep it as is. In the other realm, absolutely to change one's political behavior. 
Well, uh, this is also very many. Uh, yes. Yes. Well, a lot of this. Well, you, you yes. Well, I think that there's a point here that you that, that lies behind your point, which is an interesting one to emphasize, that multiculturalism in our midst, I mean, I don't know what other people mean by it, but the way it functions is basically, you know, I always think of the Beatles song, um, you know, that used to be also the, oh, on, on Sesame Street is where I saw it, Sesame Street used it, you know, you would see five little heads, each of them a different color, and everybody would be singing, all together now, all together now, all together now, all together now, all together now. All together. And this is really the way the campus is expected to go. Multiculturalism means everybody is different, but God forbid that I should recognize that there's any real difference. But the truth of the matter is that the most substantial differences that we're talking about here are differences in political culture. And there are profound differences in political culture and here's the interesting thing about American exceptionalism. We were talking about this earlier. May I make this point? I think the question is always asked, is America like others? Notice, you, no politician can get elected in this country on a platform of anti-Semitism. That, to me, is a definition of a country where constitutional culture is really thick. I mean, where the texture of democracy is thick. In other words, it's not just voting, everybody voting. It's really that, that, that you take on collective responsibility for your own polity. So Democrats blame Republicans, Republicans blame Democrats, and now I think politics is pretty nasty in this regard, but at least the two of them understand that together, these two sides have to resolve how to run this country. But you notice that people who have tried it, it's not that politicians in this country have not tried it. People have tried to resort to anti-Semitism. It doesn't work. So this is very telling about the depth of, uh, what, what, whatever you want to call it, really, the depth of, of, of democracy, really, of democratic culture uh, in, in America. It is not that deep in many other countries, including countries of Europe. And where it's not deep, anti-Semitism is always available. You see, your comments, uh, especially in the historical setting, ignored one central point, which is the, uh, the religious point, Jews, Christians, and Arabs. This surely is uh, an important component of uh, this battle, especially historically. And it was totally, totally ignored. Absolutely right. And and uh, I've written a book um, uh, which is, uh, on which this talk is based called Jews and Power, and I make your point exactly that, um, yes, I, I began by saying that there are many other dimensions and the religious one is extremely important, but I want to focus on the political point and without at all ignoring the components of the religious Obviously, you can place them into this. You can weave them into it. But what, what disturbs me, I didn't, I didn't even allude to this, what got me started on this subject was that um, the view of Jewish history until very recently was that Jews, after the destruction of the temple, had no politics. You see, as, as I said, you know, that it was as if the soul arose from the body. And for example, Sailor Baron, my marvelous teacher, writes about the social and religious history of the Jews. Notice, the social and religious history of the Jews. What does that tell you? He's not writing about the political history of the Jews. And this, this is very recently have people begun to understand that Jews have a political history and that in fact our political history may be at least as important as our religious history. Because the religious history is much more important to us, but the political history has, is, is what has made us central to the whole world at this point. So I think it's to that that we have to begin paying some attention. But I mean, I thank you very much. It is a lacuna, you're absolutely right. 
body um, and become independent. And, and so in that regard, what I'm, what I'm asking Dr. Weiss is, is if, are you suggesting on some level that we have brought about our own <coughs> I can't tell you how grateful I am for your question because in, in writing this book and giving this talk and making this point, this is my overriding fear that um, this will be interpreted. If my point is that the Jews should not blame themselves, how is it that I seem to be doing nothing but holding the Jews responsible for their fate? Um, this is a real conundrum. and. Here's how I would respond to it. Um, of course, I don't hold Jews retroactively accountable. And I would say that that's what I meant by experiment. Jews launched in history one of the world's great political experiments. And from one point of view, I would really like to stress, and in the book I try to do that, how extraordinarily successful that experiment was. You know, J Jews were, uh, uh, Toynbee thought that we were a, 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 a fossil. I mean, the, the, the history of creativity is just unimaginable here, right? And that's why these Nobel Prizes and all the rest of it, who else can adjust to modernity? We are experts at the toughest thing of all, which is adjustment, adaptation. That's a result of the, that experiment. However, it had consequences. Those consequences, an experiment, you cannot see in advance in an experiment what the consequences will be. But if you conduct an experiment, you have to see after the fact what it brought about. That's where we are at. That's, that's the point. So you can't say, no, you shouldn't have launched this, or it would have been better if we Not at all. But having seen what it led to and where we are now, the most horrible thing would be to deceive ourselves into thinking, oh my god, wouldn't it be wonderful just to become a diasporist people again? Do you, do you know how popular diasporism is in Jewish studies nowadays? Do you know what a longing there is for that? for that idea of that wonderful time when Jews were powerless and so on. I mean, there's a terrific longing for that. This is what I am saying is, it would, would be absurd. Uh, not only, not, and impossible, but do you see my point, the distinction? Uh, thank you so much for asking that. Can, it, can someone be an anti-Zionist and an anti-Semite? And, and not an anti-Semite. Um, well, of, of, I would say, um, what does, what does uh, Zionist mean altogether? The, the reason that the term, what would have happened to the term had Israel simply been accepted as a country? Zionism would have become a historical term. Zionism was the movement that brought Israel into existence, period. The only reason that Zionism exists as a, uh, as a uh, controversial subject is because the Arabs have made Israel contingent. They have never recognized it. So they have kept it contingent. So all anti-Zionism is, I tried to point out, that anti-Zionism is not just an extension of anti-Semitism. It is a um, raising of anti-Semitism to a much, much higher degree. Um, we'll take a few more questions. There's a bit of time left. And after the Q&A session, there's going to be a reception through this door. There's a refreshment. Thank you for a really, really rational presentation. <laughs> One of the things that troubles me from a greatly is that beyond rationality, now this anti-Semitism, notably in the Middle East, has an emotional component. Yes. Has generations of children having been taught hatred, yes. a very strong emotion. And I don't know how you deal with emotions in a rational way. I, I it's a terrific know. question. They're terrific questions. Well, this is really the crux of the matter, too. If you're talking about it, well, I think that the, uh, 
approach to your question is a tactical, should be a tactical one. In other words, that is a marvelous question, and the answer should be found, what is the arena in which the problem is arising, and how do you deal with it um, tactically in that arena? So let me give you an example. Um, on, on a college campus, right, I, I give a talk um, to a group of students. It's on a Friday night under Jewish auspices, tables, everything wonderfully set out and so on, and afterwards I'm supposed to give a talk. Uh, a whole cadre of Arab students have come to sit there. They don't want to join in the tables, um, although of course they're invited to partake of the meal. They don't want to do that. They sit demonstratively at the wall, along the wall, and sit there waiting politely for the lecture to be over and for everything. So what does this tell you in body language? That clearly they have come, you know, with a kind of adversarial posture. Sure enough, the <laughs> lecture is over and question period comes and one of them gets up and says, um, why is Israel an apartheid state? Now, uh, exactly your thing, coming from some irrational core, nothing to do with the topic, not relating to it, coming from something else. I say to this student, why did you kill your grandmother? He looks at me, as you look at me, what are you, talking, you, know, what are you talking about? And he repeats his question. I say, I have heard your question. I am asking you a question in front of all these people. Why did you kill your grandmother? And I say, come on, where is she? Can you produce her for us? Um, and um, come on, why don't you defend yourself? Why don't you tell me? And then I try to explain to everybody, you see, you're looking at this young man now, and you're thinking, does she know something? Does she know something about him? Suddenly, you're very suspicious of him, and he, my goodness, he has to answer to himself. I said, that is what you're trying to do to me, this is what you're trying to do to the Jewish people, and it will not be allowed. <laughs> so, in that, now that's in that arena, I would say. Take another arena, you do the same thing. The government of Israel should be capable of doing the same kind of thing in its arena. Well, the question is, I mean, I think that we are in a, you have, to, you have to assess the political realities of the moment. I think that the political situation, as we all know, is pretty dire. But in some ways, I think we have to remind ourselves that it is far better than uh, what I have faced in my lifetime, um, class of 36 myself. So um, I would say that there's no comparison between what we face today. After all, the United States of America is the most powerful country on earth as long as it remains, as long as it chooses to remain so. And, um, and it understands, I don't think James Wolsey is the only person in America who understands this connection that I've been making. They don't articulate it this way. I mean, I think it does have to be articulated much more clearly. But I think that, you know, I was saying Charles before, to my mind, there are more voices today, brilliant voices, powerful, passionate, excellent voices for the Jews than ever before in history. I mean, when did one ever have an organization like APAC? 
you know, read about Mordechai and Esther in the book of, uh, of, of Esther. Uh, we had to rely on that for our political security as compared, <laughs> as compared with what you have today in this country. You really have organizations. The American Jewish Committee years ago when I got to know it was an apologist organization. Today, I don't know about its lay leadership, but it's, but it's uh, the people running that organization are unbelievably strong and smart and dedicated. We've got to, we've got to fight to win. <laughs> and we will. Yes, definitely. So Ellen, the final question, and then we'll, we'll go to the reception where we can continue the discussion informally. There's a general reluctance to bring up accusations of anti-Semitism. One example that came to mind, especially when, when you, you mentioned the triangle and religious, is Jimmy Carter's book where there were accusations that we were accusing him of anti-Semitism when that accusation hadn't been made. And then he smears the Jewish people, and then there are uh, some people mentioned that you know he made you know anti-Semitic smears, and are we making a mistake by not bringing up accusations of anti-Semitism when it's pretty clear that there is some there? Well, I think that there are. Look, uh, this institute was not here a few years ago, and here it is now at Yale University, and uh, it's it's doing its its job, drawing attention to a political. Reality. I mean, it's just, it, it's not a flag waving thing. This is, a, as I say, it is a problem on the table. And I, I agree that one ought to, but in each case, you see, there's no, you, one has to be extremely discriminating, clever. You can't, you, you, we can't be crude. In other words, you're very smart. I mean, I'm sure that you can understand why in some cases it is wise to do X and in other cases it is wise to do Y. In some, you choose your targets, you choose your moments, you, 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 uh, you conserve your energies for the things which are more powerful. I mean, you have to, you know, you have to be clever. Thanks.